Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Javier with The Real Javier Novois, a channel, a platform, and a modality where we apply the principles of philosophy, spirituality, mysticism, and ethics to rapid lifestyle transformation, ladies and gentlemen. And as we always say, if you find value in our material, please subscribe to the channel below because you'll be putting your energy in with a community of master manifestors as well as helping us get the word out. And it's a very important time not only for humanity but also for the trajectory of this channel as we're in the middle of a program of refining ourselves of implementing a strategic plan to be free from the prison grid within a year, and I would say even much sooner than that, but we're giving it a year to give you breathing space. If you want to look at our strategic planning uh, modus operandi, you can look at our past probably 20 videos, and there are a lot of them in there. We already did the stage of meta planning where we plan the plan. If you've not done that, it's okay. You can do that even within a day. You just need to ask yourself some questions like, how can I set aside for that plan time? How can I uh, you know, set aside space? And how can I make sure and commit to myself that I will participate in that plan? And right now we are in the first six months, the first few days of that, which is the iteration and testing phases of which we are going to be getting very specific in the next few videos. But today I just wanted to take another, should we say, 70,000 feet high approach here. I want to go into a very deep issue, and it's an issue that might even bother some people in the manifestation community, because it's not talked about a lot. Although Abraham Hicks hints at it, and although Neville Goddard spoke about it frequently, many people today act as if it does not exist. And by the way, Joel Goldsmith also spoke about it. But many people act as if it does not exist or as if it is automatically or spontaneously arising in the very act of manifestation, in the very application of the principles. And that is true over time, and that is true in a generalized framework, but is not always true for the individual, and often the individual will suffer for not knowing the topic or applying the topic that we're talking about tonight. Indeed, I've gotten a lot of questions over the last weekend, over the last week, about what should I desire? How should I, shall we say, detail and construct my desire? How should I know if the desire is really mine? And how should I know what order, so to speak, to put into the universe? As in Manifest, we know a desire is as if you're putting in an order to the universe and then you allow the universe to fulfill that order. Of course, as Joel Goldsmith said, you may desire a thing and you may manifest a thing, or as he called it, demonstration. You may demonstrate a thing and then be very sorry later. What is the main prevention, so to speak, the preventative measure, the inoculation, that you can give yourself to make sure that your desire is not harmful to you in the end and harmful to others. Well, Neville Goddard talked about it. He said that you can he and I'm paraphrasing here, he said because the Bible says of God, I create and I destroy. I give life and I give death and so on and so forth, good and evil. And while it would be shocking to many people that God would be the author of evil, the biblical scripture does state that. And that could be interpreted Thus, you can manifest anything that you want, including harming others. And Neville Goddard said, I cannot hide this from you because it's a fact. You can do that. You can destroy and you can harm. And not only that, you can unintentionally <clears throat> harm yourself. So he said, always make sure that you follow the golden rule. And of course, the golden rule in Christianity is love the Lord thy God and love thy neighbor as thyself. Do it with love and do it with goodwill to everybody, to yourself and to others. Now, again, many uh, people in manifesting will not touch this subject directly because it goes into morality. But I'm going to tackle it head on. In fact, I'm going to do even more. 
I want to, not in this video, because this video is just going to be a sketchy introduction. We are coming out, well, I'm not going to tell you yet, but wait for exciting news here in the next few weeks and months. Very exciting news about this modality. But <clears throat> I am constructing, of course it's not original, but it's going to be original in the application that we're doing to this channel. I'm constructing a code of morality, a general code, a code of morality and ethics that will be able to guide you in your desires, in formulating those desires, or rather in filling out the detail of those desires. That's a very important thing, ladies and gentlemen, but I think the reason that Law of Assumption, Law of Attraction authors don't go into morality and don't go into ethics is because it's reminiscent of a sort of puritanical morality or a puritanical ethics that modern and literalist interpretations of religious beliefs have taught over the years. But morality and ethics has nothing to do with that. And, you know, the etymological definition of morality, as I was just looking up in an etymological dictionary, and I knew this, but I just wanted to get the wording, was that literally pertaining to manners. And of course, etikos is also, in Greek, is actually the word for this, ethics. And Latin is mos. The genitive, of course, is moris, which means one's disposition. Mores, customs, manners, and morals. That is, basically, in one's bearing, in one's carrying. And what is that? That is exactly what we describe into this channel as state, ladies and gentlemen. Morals and manners, or shall we say moral, is the manner or the way of being of your state. So it's very important to know what code of morality that you're subscribing to and consciously using as a sieve or a filter for choosing your state. And Neville Goddard spoke about this. He said many times in his books and his lectures, you, because, remember, you can have anything you want any way that you want. Why? Because the way of getting there and the way of, of being in that state is also a desire. And you're given anything that you want. Anything that you create here will manifest here. So, of course, you can create it <clears throat> according to your own moral code. <clears throat> and Neville Goddard said this, when you create, when you desire, when you get into the state, do it according to your own wonderful moral code. And of course you have to design and craft your morality. And your morality is going to change as it is applied. The application of that is going to change as it is applied. And of course in the Islamic tradition we know this is fiqh. And of course fiqh changes according to the application of the situation, so on and so forth, and the knowledge and the interpretative power, and so on and so forth. But we're going to make this very simple, and we want to just make it into some general rules of thumb and principles that you can use, not for getting to your desire, remember. Because the getting there is not up to you. None of this is ever to attain an end, because whenever you take an action, it should be an inspired action, and you should do it without expecting any outcome, without any prejudice as to the outcome. But when choosing the outcome, because as Vadim Zelen said, and Neville Goddard said, we don't create the script, basically. We choose the script. You're free to choose any script that you like, but you cannot change the script once you're in the script. And just as a free-flowing contemplation, this also ties in with your ethical code morality. Because your morality will be dictated according to the script that you're on. And of course, when you change a script, the application of that morality will change as well in action and so on and so forth. So, I hope you're following me here just a little bit. But, the main question of this is, and what, we're gonna, what we want to just briefly touch on in this video is a lot of people have asked me, what should I desire? 
Because Abraham Hicks talks about just going general and desiring general. And you can never go wrong there. It'll just come slower. But you can always say, I just enjoy ease. And I just want to, you know, create ease and joy and optimism. And you can go there many times. It will carry you wherever you want to go. But for those of us who are business people, for those of us who are creative, in fact, we came here to create specifically. So how do I choose those specifics that I want? Because here's the kicker. And this is another thing that many Law of Trash and Law of Assumption teachers don't go into because it's very nuanced. Okay? But actually, Abraham has talked about it. I may think I want something, but I don't really want it. Why? Because I haven't contemplated it enough. I haven't contemplated what the end result would be. So that's why, especially, you don't have to do this with every desire. You can't do this with every desire because you don't have time. Because it's about focus. But for the major aspects of your major desires, you need to map them out as much as you can and as much as it feels good to do, and then you need to look at at least the major components of that and ask myself, is this really my desire? Now, I want, let's say I say I want a red house. Well, I can go into that and say, is that really my desire? <laughs> and I might explore it and I might say, well, yes, because I like this color and so on and so forth, and that's it. But I might say, no, I want this, I really want this so I can show this off to people. And then you dig deeper into that. Is a good reason for desiring something to show off to people? In fact, what is a reason for desiring something? And that's where we get into Stoicism. That's where it's going to help us out a lot. I was reading The Inner Citadel by the great uh, Pierre Ado about Marcus Aurelius. And he said this. I just wanted to give you a quote actually from Marcus Aurelius. He talks about the three rules of life, which are the rules of judgment which when you judge, you should do, do, do so objectively, which means that you should do it according to truth and not according to some filtered prejudice of the mind. And then, of course, the second one is desire, and that is consent to destiny. Now, how does that tie in with our uh, modality? Well, it ties in because when you're on the film road, you know that that's destined, and you have to consent to that, and you don't resist that. You understand? But... You simply focus on the next script or the next film role, and then you allow that destiny to play out. So this fits in perfectly with our modality here. And then, of course, uh, he goes into the third rule, which is impulse towards action, human nature, justice, and altruism. And this is putting things in their proper place, ladies and gentlemen. This is morality, and this is ethics. Of course, we'll talk about that as well. But... Marcus Aurelius said, always and everywhere it depends on you to, one, piously to rejoice in the present conjunction of events. Don't resist where you are. Rather, no matter what is happening, rejoice in it. Now, why? Because, again, all is one. There's no separation. Therefore, whatever is happening is your desire. And, in fact, it can be seen from the human perspective. It can be seen in the game as that is happening for your own good. Indeed, as many uh, great Law of Assumption teachers have taught, <clears throat> you can say that anything that is happening now is the path to your desire. Because it is. Because Abraham Hicks says, if a negative thing happens, all that's doing is beefing your vortex up more. All that's doing is shooting more rockets of desire. And all that's doing is painting the canvas more. So it is the path to your desire. Also, you can always toggle to the opposite. You can always change film roles and say, okay, what is the exact opposite of this? Well, I'm there. Let's say I lost all my money. Well, the exact opposite to this to me may be that I have a million dollars. Now go there. In your imagination, you're there. So this can actually act as an impetus to going into your imagination. It's a good thing. As Sam Harris taught about, these negative emotions become sort of like alarm triggers for mindfulness. That's exactly what we're talking about here. So you can always rejoice in the present conjunction of events. Something bad happened to me? Yes, thank God. Why? Because there's an equal provision on the other side that I can now abide in, that I can 
dwell in more and that I can take a lesson from. Then he said to conduct yourself with justice toward whatever people are present. That means have a good intention. And how will you know that your contention, intention is good? Well, you follow your highest emotion and your highest excitement. This goes into inspired action. If you're acting towards others or even thinking towards others unlovingly, then you know that this is going, not going to have a good result because it makes you feel bad. Your emotional indicator is going to tell you that that is not the good platform to take or a good way to go and so on and so forth. And so if you just follow your highest excitement, you will be treating people with justice, and people includes you, by the way, because we're all one, there's no separation. That is justice, ladies and gentlemen. Because no matter what you do on the outer, if you're trying to take actions to be just, you might make a mistake. A judge might make an unjust judgment by mistake. And would anyone say that that's injustice? No. It all depends on the mindset and the feeling. Therefore, your barometer, your key here, is how does it feel? If I'm taking vengeance on someone, how does that feel? Well, it might feel better than depression, <clears throat> but it's going to be much worse than contentment or joy and love. And that's where you get into justice. And of course, wisdom also and justice are putting things in their proper place. Wisdom is very much related to justice, so. In fact, an Arabic judge is Hakim, or Hakim, a ruling is Hukum, and wisdom is Hikmah. So these words, justice and wisdom, are very much intertwined, especially in law of Semitic languages. So. And he also says, to apply the rules of discernment to your present representation. Representation means whatever you're imagining or presenting to yourself as the scenario that's before you. This goes into contest, ladies and gentlemen. The contest of what surrounds you, of who you are, of who surrounds you, of all of those aspects and that plethora of different moving atoms, so to speak, that is what the Stoics call representation. It ties in beautifully with what we talk about on this channel. He says, do apply the rules of discernment so that nothing non-objective may infiltrate its way in. And non-objective means something that's emotionally destructive, something that's not on your path, and something that basically is n n unloving. Because love here is the byword. The heart here is the arbiter in this. So what principles might we use to filter our representations? Well, an understanding of metaphysics. And metaphysics, as the great Bashar said, is physics without the math. So an understanding of physics, an understanding of science, and believe me, ladies and gentlemen, everything that we talk about on this channel is science and philosophy based. Because we test everything, we prove everything, and if it's not proved by science, and if it's not logical or rational, we don't teach it. We don't do it because the only thing that's going to work is something that's true in reality. So physics is the best picture that we have right now of the essence of reality. And physics is teaching us what? That there's no separation. It's teaching us the observer effect. That the observer affects the observed phenomenon. So mind really does create matter and mind creates reality and in fact all matter is within mind. That is physics. That's indisputable scientific facts, ladies and gentlemen, philosophical facts. So once you understand this, you realize that this world, or as in Arabic is described as a dunya, is actually an illusion. It's a projection, ladies and gentlemen. It's like the shadows in Plato's cave. Once we come out of that cave, then you have all of the principles you need to filter the representation. So, did I receive a news that somehow indicates that I'm not achieving my desire and that I'm separate from my desire? Have I received something that makes me upset? Well, no, that that cannot be true. Because why? Because you are one with everything that you desire. You're one with the divinity. You're one with everything. So therefore, that's false. Anything that penetrates your consciousness that seems as if it's a negative for you, 
that's false. So you can use that information and you can re-represent yourself the picture of the contest that you're receiving. I hope you understand me just a little bit. So for example, if you get some bad news, you can use what Neville Goddard calls revision. You can revise that and say, no, I didn't hear that. I heard this and you can recreate the scene. You can also just do what the Stoics do and just receive the news and say, okay, just like Epictetus said, so-and-so went to prison. Is there anything more? And the student would respond, nothing more. So so-and-so went to prison is just a physical fact. But we do not, therefore, shall we say, explicate from that 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 is a bad thing. Because anything, again, can be turned into a good thing. These are the principles, these are the ethics, so to speak, of what you have to contemplate. So, not to make this video unnecessarily long, so to speak. We don't want to make this video unnecessarily long. What should you desire? And we're going to be going into this philosophical type of discussion more, just so that we can get a good working model of moral and ethics to apply to our manifestations here. Remember, if you're chase if you're chasing after a still shot or a photograph, that cannot be the desire. That's simply a representation of the desire. Remember that. So, for example, when Neville Goddard says, imagine the scene, let's say you want to be with a specific person. But you can imagine the scene of you kissing that person, and you can loop it over and over again. And that will get you into the state to get that desire. But what is your desire? Neville Goddard said, imagine what would happen after receiving your desire. That is in the process of your desire. So remember, what you desire is never a still shot. It's a process. And you can prove this by the said fact. Let's say you desire a million dollars. Well, once you get the million dollars, what are you going to do with it? You want to spend it. You're going to figure out what to spend it on. That's a process. And I would contend that your real desire is the figuring out what to spend it on. So that's the other thing. That's the second principle. Is that the process is never physical. It's always mental and spiritual. Because the getting of physical things, well those physical things are just, shall we say, placeholders. Or they're like the little... Uh, stuffed animals that are held in front of dogs and dog races that the dogs chase. But they're not the end. The end is a continual process. So where does that take us? That takes us to the fact that you're not in your desires to attain an end. Because you can give yourself the end immediately. Don't seek the end. Seek nothing. Seek only the enjoyment of the process. And that's the ethic. You have to ask yourself when you have a desire, what's the real process that I'm seeking in this desire? And then don't seek it. Do it and be it. And then imagine yourself taking the steps of the process. Imagine to yourself what that process is like. And if it's a process that you enjoy, you know that's your true desire. If it's process in there that you don't enjoy, know that that's not your desire. For example, and this is going to be the closing example. Let's say you desire to be a doctor. You want to have that MD degree. Your parents would be impressed. Many people would be impressed. You'd make a lot of money. But once you've boiled that desire down into the process, parts of the process are going to be studying medicine and medical school. Then other parts of the process are going to be dealing with patients and dealing with some rather mundane things. As I know a lot of doctors and a lot of them have to deal with some rather mundane things. Well, you might not enjoy that process and you might get a negative emotion when you think about that process. Then you'll know that that desire is not really yours. And you can always make a desire yours but it's a lot of work. What we'd encourage you to do on this channel is to find a desire that's yours and then go all into the process. That is true ethics 
and make sure that it's done in love and make sure that it's done from a high place on the emotional scale and make sure that it benefits humanity and it benefits you and you'll know that by the way it feels does it feel joy does it feel joyful or do you feel a negative emotion while going into that so that's just basically a sort of rambling disparate contemplation on morality and ethics we're going to be going more into this we're going to be fine-tuning this and we're going to be telling you more steps of that process and other videos thanks for watching guys we will be continuing this week with more processes and with more steps for the strategic plan for the second six months of the strategic plan getting free from a job and a boss within a year is what this channel is all about I am doing coaching calls where I will help you make months and years of progress in only weeks because we use the Pareto principle and we use leverage and we use theory of constraints and other principles that will help you supercharge your life and your business get free from a job and a boss thanks for watching ladies and gentlemen much love and remember remain in state and I will see you guys very soon